Colossians chapter one, verse 23 through 29. If you're checking out Christianity, you can chill here, you can laugh. Um, you don't have to dress a certain way. I'm glad you're here. Let's read the Bible together. Colossians chapter one, verse 23. Paul says this, remember he's in prison trying to encourage a church. He says, if indeed you continue in the faith, in other words, it's not a one-stop shop, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. In other words, when you hear the good news of Jesus, be an anchor to that. When a, when a, when a world brings storms, you can rest and stay. Everybody say stay. It's so good that you don't have to evolve from it. Love it. Which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Everybody say minister. Yeah, this is crucial. Is that a cicada? No, that's somebody's alarm. God's calling you, sister. Answer the call. Okay. Apostle Paul is saying here, when I heard this good news, what is good news? We sin, he saves. The good news was so good that I bent my knee to my own will, my own way, and I said, I'm gonna go your way. Mm. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. He says that in prison. And in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. Everybody say the church. That's you. So if, you, if somebody taught you growing up that you like got in a car and went to some building and that was called the church, I apologize on, on behalf of people that had good intent. You as the people gathered are the church. The building's not the church, amen? So like when you woke up and brushed your teeth this morning, how many of you brushed your teeth? Okay, if you're sitting by somebody that didn't raise their hand, Okay. <laughs> when you looked in the mirror this morning, you saw the church. We are the church, of which I became a minister. Somebody say minister. We're going to teach about this word today that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. In other words, this good news about Jesus, it's the best thing ever. We want you to know it and really know it. The mystery of the hidden of the ages, but now revealed to his saints. In other words, this whole spirituality thing is hard to understand, but now that Jesus has come, oh, it's so clear. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles, non-Jews, are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which Christ in you, I'm gonna stop right here, the hope of glory. If you're taking notes, if you have your phone, if you have your phone, you can just go to your notes and, and write this one word down. Minister, minister, minister. He says several times here, when I met Jesus, when I had my moment of like, I was going the wrong way and I decided to go his way, he says over and over, I became a minister. Now, you're not talking about a guy with a collar. You're not talking about a guy who was ever on salary at a church. He's a tent maker, met Jesus, and he became a minister. And today, I want you to know something. You are a minister. No, you're my minister preacher. I don't know why I'm talking that Southern. <laughs> but today, I wanna I want show you in the word how you and I were meant, watch this, you and I were meant to become a minister. Can I pray? God, would you, in a world full of opinions and judgmentalness and lackluster living, I pray that you would speak to us. We're not interested in opinions. They don't do much for us. But it is your word that changes us. We become better not when we increase our moral resolve, but rather when we bend our knee to Jesus and say, if you are that, I'll follow you. If you're king, if you're creator, if you're the image of God, if you can forgive and redeem, if you can save me from my shortcomings, my sin, I, I'll follow you. And then, Father, we trust that you're going to make us into ministers. Do something in this service, Father, that changes somebody's life. We will give you all the praise, all the credit for changed lives. In your wonderful name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Matt. I want to talk about the word minister today. When we get to this text, we don't like to skip over it. We just teach and, teach and preach through it. The original language here for the word minister is diakonos. Everybody say diakonos. Yeah, that's the original language. Today, when I say the word minister, there's some type of clout that you probably give to it. Maybe you've heard of like a prime minister, or maybe you think a minister is the guy on the stage with the microphone. And you need to know that when Paul is saying the word minister, Paul is using the word diakonos. You know what it means? It means busboy. Paul said, when I met Jesus, I became the lowliest of low servants. That with all my accolades and who I studied under and all, uh, the most prolific writer of all time, when I met Jesus and I became more like Jesus, I became a minister. 
In a world that says, how high can you climb? I figured out it's much different than that. It's how low can you go? And we have a Savior and we have a Lord. And although he could have climbed high, he went low. I mean, we're talking about the leader of our organization washed people's feet. And that was so contrary to what society taught, what culture taught. And he too is saying, hey, I became a minister. And I don't know if anybody's ever told you this, but you are, (laughs) some of you are like, man, I wish I wouldn't have came to church today. You are becoming a minister. And if you thought a minister was the tidied up person with the collar, that's not what Paul says a minister is. A minister is a servant. Now, I know you have a job, and I hope you're good at your job, and if you don't have a job, there's a whole book in the Bible called Job, you ought to go get one, (laughs) right? Some of y'all will get that tomorrow. But above your job, above just being a parent, you have a calling. Like, there's a reason why you're on a planet. If you have a pulse, you have a purpose. Like, God has an intent for your life, and the thing he's trying to do in you, he's actually trying to get you to be a minister. You know why there's people in your neighborhood that pay attention to you? You know whether you have a sphere of influence? It's because God is trying to make you a minister. Jesus isn't here, and we are the embodiment of his mission. That's why he calls us the body of Christ. In fact, Peter, who learned from Paul, says this about you and I. Here's what he says in 1 Peter chapter 2. As you come to him, a living stone, God's using you as building materials, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, the way God sees you, chosen and precious. You yourselves, watch this, like living stones are being built. What are you being built in? What does God want to do in your life? Good question. You're being built as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Some of you grew up going to Catholic school and you're like, oh, snap. Can I tell you something? This is what God wants to do in your life. He wants you to become a representative. Jesus wants you to become a minister. Now, what is a minister? A minister is simple. Don't, don't, take all the accolades off. Take all the pious dress off. Take all the, the luxurious ways If we see a prime minister. And let's bring it down to the actual language of diakonos. Here's what it means. You serve God and you serve other people. In a world that says, live your life at the expense of others, you're like, no, I'm following Jesus. It's a different way. I live my life for the benefit of others. Y'all, there is a world way, which is live your life at the expense of others, and there's a God way. Paul said, and I, I don't have it figured out, but I am becoming a minister. And here's the reality. Can I just tell you this first hand? It's not easy to be a minister. Why was Paul in prison? Y'all can holler back here. Well, he was in prison for being a minister. He was serving God. Could you imagine getting thrown in jail for being a minister? Boy, I set this place on fire. I'd be, I wouldn't be writing letters. I'd be, you know, building bombs. Hello. I'm trying to get up out of this place. He's thrown into prison writing this letter because he's serving God and serving others. And I think it's crucial for you and I not to remove ourselves so much from this language. Because in that day and time, and in this day and time, it's hard to live a godly life in a godless world. Some of you feel this. Some of you guys understand it's becoming increasingly and more increasingly intolerant to those who want to live a Christian lifestyle. In fact, I'll tell you, I found a recent study that said they were studying the different people groups in America and finding out what are the most hated people groups. Did you know that one of the most hated people groups in America are conservative Christians? Like, hated. Some of you are like, I feel this. In fact, they asked progressive activists, some of you guys know some, "Um, what what do you think about these Christian people? Here's what they say about you. I just, I don't want you to detach yourself from Colossae because it's very, very similar. Here's some uh, actual quotes. Kill them all and let their God sort them out. Pretty tolerant of you guys, right? Here's another one. A torturous death would be too good for them. Good Lord. Here's another one. I regard them as subhuman. So Paul and us have to represent God, minister, serve God, and serve others in a world that doesn't love God and doesn't love ministers. So here's the question. How do you stand for God in a world that doesn't like him? How are you going to make a difference 
How are you gonna, how are you gonna become the minister that God's trying to get all of us to become to represent him in a world that's chaotic? What I love about this is Paul doesn't pull any punches. How many of you are grateful for somebody that will just tell you the truth? He's not like a jerk about it, but he just tells you the truth about, here's what it means to be a minister. So here's what I wanna do today. I've asked God by the power of his Holy Spirit in the next 25 minutes that we have together to help you see a better version of life that you could have. Just imagine. Have the faith to imagine that God somehow (laughs) could use knuckleheads like you and I. Because that's what you see in the text. Remember, this dude writing the letter here, he was no saint two, three years ago. Terrorist, his sect, his terrorist sect was in charge of killing over 10,000 Christians. So like, I know you got it bad, Usher, but he had it real bad, okay? So let me show you some things about serving, about ministering. Number one, about serving, write this down. Students, write this down. Number one, serving includes suffering. Like if we don't tell you that, and then you're like, okay, I'm gonna become like Jesus, and then you walk through some Jesus-like stuff, you're gonna walk out the back door because nobody told you, like Paul tells us, that serving includes suffering. Serving doesn't always <laughs> feel awesome. I mean, think about this. Who is our model? Who's our leader of Christian faith? Jesus. How did he change the world? By serving and by suffering. Those of you who have received salvation, you know how you got it? <laughs> it's suffering. You're like, I want to see God do a miracle. Like, there's a bunch of people. I want God to feed 5,000 people. Okay, go ask the kid if it felt like suffering giving up his long John Silver's. Amen? Suffering is included in serving. And and if if you haven't been taught this, that when things go hard, you think it's not God. Watch this. Just because it's hard does not mean God isn't in it. Paul himself, who's like, I think the greatest Christian of all time, like, I can't wait to meet Jesus in heaven, but right after I give him a high five, I'm going straight to Paul. I'm like, Paul has formed our Christian ethic and like taught us how to live and taught us about the supremacy of Christ. Like Paul is incredible. And Paul himself wasn't too easy. Like, yeah, he changed the world, but he went through a lot. In fact, he cited it when talking about this whole servanthood for you who want to be a Christian. Check out what it looked like in that day. We have a precedent. Here's what it says. Are they servants of Christ? He's, he has a competition here. Anybody competitive? Y'all line up in church. I see y'all on the soccer field, moms. You're like, I will take this. Boy, I, you know, I, I see you. Okay. He says, I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman. Here's Paul. I love Paul. With far greater labors. In other words, I outwork all of you. Any Southern men in the house? Yeah. Here we go. Far more imprisonments. He's like, I've been to jail more than all of you. I'm a felon. What's up? <laughs> With countless beatings. I didn't win them all, right? And often near death, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Serious beating here. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Some of you are like me too, wrong stoned. (laughs) Literally rocks. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers. Watch, Watch this. Danger from robbers. Danger from my own people. Danger from Gentiles. Danger in the city. Danger in the wilderness. Danger at sea. Danger from false brothers. Apostle Paul, one of the first great Christians of our faith, says, when following Jesus, this ain't a cakewalk. And if somebody has taught you, you just come on Sunday and put a flower in your hair. (laughs) I don't even know where that came from. I I literally don't know where that came from. I didn't say that in any other service. (laughs) I guess the point is, if you bought into fluffy Christianity, you're not gonna know how to handle the struggle. You know what Jesus promised us? This is real talk. The bookends of the gospel, one of the first things he said, one of the last things he said is, in this world you will have trouble. So I want you to know that trouble, suffering, hard stuff doesn't mean God isn't working. Can I tell you, God has done more in me in the struggle than he ever did on the mountaintop? If you wanna serve Jesus, don't think that you have to press the eject button when marriage gets hard. God said, I will walk you through that. In fact, in one text, he said, blessed are those who suffer for righteousness sake. I need you to know something. When somebody makes fun of you at work for praying, 
When somebody make, when, when you have a financial advisor that makes fun of your generosity and gives you a sneaky way to lie about money and makes fun of you because you have read the Bible and does what it says and reap the benefits, you need to understand that it is a badge of honor in the first century, let me show you the book of Acts. There was a doctor named Luke who like start, saw the whole church start. Here's what he said when they had to go to court. They got persecuted, he says, and then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day, they didn't even stop. In the temple from house to house, small groups, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ is Jesus. Just because it's hard doesn't mean God isn't in it. Let the church say amen. amen. Apostle Paul says effective ministry sometimes means I got to serve you while I'm hurting. <laughs> he lets us know that, so, sorry, I do that when I get excited. He lets us know that effective ministry means I serve you irregardless of what you do back to me. Serving means that I serve you irregardless of you receive it. Serving means I serve you while you spew at me. I mean, think about Jesus, our model. They just beat him and ki they're killing him. And what is his response, which is our model? For forgive them. They, they probably don't know what they're doing. Serving and suffering. Amen? I see this in the text as well. It says, I became a minister according to the stewardship. We're going right down through the text. According to the stewardship from what God was given to me. Here's another thing we have to understand about becoming a minister. Is that serving is stewardship. Serving is Stewardship. What is stewardship? Stewardship is the reality, and this is crucial for you. Jesus gave you your life, your story, your background, your gifts, your talents, what ticks you off, what makes you tick. He gave that to you as a life on loan. Your gifts aren't your own. Your talent is not your own. Your life is not your own. It's been paid for with a price. So it's just like this. It's like Jesus said, hey, I'm gonna give you that wife. I'm gonna give you that house. I'm gonna give you them kids. Now I am returning I am coming back and your life is about stewardship. Yeah. Meaning, God, I'm gonna do the best I can with what you've given me. And serving is how you make sense out of your life. Contrary to what you may have been taught, if you read the Bible and you wanna become a follower of Christ, does anybody wanna be a follower of Christ? Yeah. Come on, raise your hand there if you do care. Okay, okay. If you wanna be a follower of Christ, <laughs> serving isn't optional. Serving is essential. Jesus said this. He said, I didn't come to be served. And he's God. Y'all, if I was God, I'd have came out of heaven with a Bentley. Hello. I'd have rolled down Jerusalem streets like, how y'all doing? I'm out. Too dusty down here. Just came to see you. Give a little autograph. Take a couple pictures. I'm out. Ain't dealing with the cicadas. Ain't got no time for it. I'm out. Chariots of fire, Bentley, you know, a little sushi in the back. You know, I, I don't know. No, 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 no. Jesus, very different. This was like no other kingdom. He said, I didn't come to be served. And I'm God, I could be. I came to relinquish all of that to let you know life is not about how high you can go. And by the way, that's why you have anxiety. You were never meant to obsess about the ladder you climb. You were meant to see how low you can get by serving others. Yeah. One verse says this, I must decrease you are like, what? Yeah, because you have never been taught this. Society doesn't say this. They say, use people to get what you want. Live life at the expense of others, and Christianity is so different. It's like that neighbor, you were put there in that place, and you are going to have to steward the sphere of influence I've given you. Serving isn't optional. It's essential. Yeah. Let me say it this way. Serving is the reason why you're not in heaven already. If serving wasn't essential, the moment you committed your life to Christ, he would have taken you to heaven. If the job is done at belief, there's no point in you being here, he would just take you to heaven. The very fact that you are here means God has something for you to do. Way more important, like you're becoming a minister, way more important than your job, and I hope you crush it, is that God has a supernatural plan for your life. I grew up in church and nobody told me that. I did not know we had a plan. Let me show you a verse that changed my life. Ephesians chapter two, another letter from Paul to a church, just like us. It says, for we are his workmanship. How many people grew up in church? He's still working on me. Remember that one? Nobody in this service. Awesome, cool. 
<laughs> Boy, I'm hotter than a pig at Edley's. It's... Listen, if you don't like laughing, you're going to hate heaven. So just let your spirit remind your face how good God has been. Some of y'all are like this. <laughs> We're an equal opportunity offender around here. Everybody gets offended. All right, here we go. For we are a workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Why are we creating Christ Jesus? What is Jesus trying to do in me? Here's what he's trying to do. For good works. Let me help your theology, your belief in Jesus real quick. You don't work to get saved. But when you saved, you get to work. Yeah. You don't have to work to be saved, but the moment God saves you, you're like, hold up, all my crap, all my sin, all my shame, all my guilt, totally erased. Whew, I feel worthy now. Why? He's so good. So I got something to do. God, watch this. God has a divine to-do list for you, which God prepared beforehand. He knew you were gonna be you and still gave it to you, that we should walk in them. And that's the goal of this church, that you would walk in in the exact plan that God has for you. Why? He's trying to make you a minister. This freaks some of you out because you look in the mirror and you see you and you're like, man, I ain't no minister. <laughs> it is Jesus that makes you clean enough. It is Jesus that washes you. It is Jesus that equips you. The pressure has been lifted because the payment has been paid. Can I get amen? If Jesus has been good to you, give him a hand clap of praise. Awesome. Good news. So like once you give your life to Christ, if you haven't done of that, do it today. It's a decision, it's free. God wanted that part to be free so you, I, you and I couldn't take credit. Now after that, there's some work. What's the work? Two things, write these down if you're taking notes. And if you're not taking notes, go ahead and write these down. Two things, number one, in reach, number two, outreach. Let me start here. The last 20 years, we as a church, like global church, have gotten a lot better, I think, at making sure you get outside of the walls of a building and are actually the church and you're reaching the city. You're finding people that are less fortunate, the unhoused. You're finding needs and you're meeting them. In fact, I went to the website last night. You guys do so well at this. I wanna applaud and honor you. Just in the, the month of, in the next like 30 days, there's like 12 projects, right? And then at the end of July, we have a whole thing called Serve Week. I mean, imagine this. Imagine if you and I found, I don't know, found a neighbor and a person's a friend of mine and we, we, we got some tools and we went over and fixed somebody's house. And how many of you guys agree, like if you were elderly and you had some things you couldn't fix, that it would be very helpful if, if a couple of us showed up and fixed it, right? Do you feel that? Okay, but imagine if it was 10 of us. What if 10 of us showed up at Miss Eileen's house? That's what I think of when I think of our elderly, Miss Eileen. Oh, she makes good yellow chocolate cake. Anybody know about red eye gravy? Time out. Anybody know about tomato gravy? Anybody know about chocolate gravy? Yeah. Oh, that's my people right there. Okay, imagine if 10 of us showed up to help her, all the tools. How big of a difference would it make in Eileen's life? Now watch this. This summer, the last week of July, over a thousand of us will dispatch in serve week to go find a need and fill it. Yeah. Why? This is why we gather we gather to look like Jesus. When Jesus saw a need, when he saw the sick, when he saw the hurting, when he saw the needy, it wasn't how high can I climb and I confuse my self-worth with my net worth. <laughs> it's not what he did. The savior of the world got on his knees with a dish rag and was a bus boy. Yeah. So when world tells you it's about how much you gather and he who has the most toys wins, you can try that. Good luck, but that isn't Christianity. The life that you want to fill, the transcendent, the make a difference, the plunder hell, populate heaven. I wake up every day knowing I'm here on purpose. That life is not about how high you can go, it's about how low you can go. It's not about how much clout you can gather. How many, how many lives can you make better today? That's outreach, it's like the city. And then here's one that I would say I want us to get better at. As the broad sea church, yeah, let's reach the city, but what about across the aisle? Yeah. What about in your small group? There's somebody sitting on your row right now that may have trouble paying the electric bill. Can we just be the church if we see a need? We don't have to, let me just pray about it. You don't have to pray about it, do it. You don't have to pray about it. Well, let me just, I just wanna see what the Lord says. Mm -mm. No? 
He already said it. You want a word? He already said it. Go. Can we just not be a, let me just pray about it. Mm-mm. If you see a need, you meet a need. If you see a hole, you fill a hole. In reach is all about loving each other. I hope that you haven't bought into Western consumerism that means I go and sit in a chair on Sunday and that's the height of it. If you've done that, no wonder you're underwhelmed. Christianity would be super boring if all you did is come sit in a chair, that's dumb. But if you got involved and participated in what God like wants you to become, which is a minister, then when you find somebody that's having a tough time, their teenagers going through a tough time, you show up. And can I tell you what God's looking for? God isn't looking for superstars. Listen, I know the city we live in tells you to be glittery, tells you to shine, tells you to climb the ladder. Not Christianity. Christianity is not how fruitful can you be first, it's how faithful can you be. If you want want to know how I would love for the city to describe you as a people, you ready for this? Faithful servants. You know what I love about faithful? Faithful. It's predictable. It shows up. It's not perfect, not glamorous. It just shows up. You ever had somebody in your life that wouldn't tell you things like, I'll pray about it, but they just showed up? We must become that. Reminds me, my daddy grew up in uh, Wyoming. Anybody ever been to Wyoming? It's fire. You got to go. And we went to Yellowstone, and it reminds me of this old geyser they called Old Faithful. Do you know four million people a year come to see this one? Uh, old faithful, every, every 63 to like 70 minutes, it goes off. And what you need to know is it's, it's not actually the biggest. It's not the most exciting. It's not the highest geyser even in the park. Watch this. It's just predictable. And they call it old faithful. You know, in order for you to make an impact, you don't have to exaggerate your giftings. You don't have to strive. You don't have to be perfect. Because I don't know about you, when I went through a rough time, I don't need you to come impress me. Strengths may impress people, but the real life attracts people. Can we just decide to hear Paul and say, you know, I'm going to become a minister by just becoming faithful? Faithful just means I show up. That if I'm in town, man, you can count on me. That's what each other needs. It reminds me a couple weeks ago, I got to sit down with a couple Um. Their names are Jeremiah and Sydney. Check out this picture. If I'd have looked like this, I'd have been married like three years sooner. <laughs> Don't you just hate good looking people? <laughs> just hate them, right? Thank God my wife's gorgeous. I sat down with them and got to know them just a little bit better and um, found out that they're really, really good at their jobs and like just wildly good. And, really busy at their jobs and both crushing it at their jobs. They're also engaged. Come on, you give it up for that. Also engaged so that like they're about to get married. And how many of you guys know, if you have busy lives and then you get engaged, busy is like busy squared, right? Venues. And then what type of music? And then food tastings. And then more venues and more food tastings, and how big is the bridal party going to be, and who's all coming, and all the plans, and all the web. You guys go bonkers over weddings, and their wedding's going to be unbelievable, and the truth is, they have no time. Yet, every single week, you and I are the beneficiary of their serving. See, every single week, they minister to kids, And when I was talking to them in the midst of their crazy, chaotic life, you know what you couldn't wipe off their face? A smile. You know what they kept talking about? Although their jobs are crushing it and they're closing all the, and it's incredible, and a wedding and everybody's coming. The thing that they talked about, the thing that made them smile was teaching your kids the fruit of the Spirit. Wow. Don't have time to do it but they just prioritize you, serving you. And my eight-year-old knows the fruit of the Spirit, can quote them and fired up about it, knows the books of the Bible, can quote Scripture. Why? Because there's a couple that doesn't have time to serve, but they said, you know what? Serving isn't optional in Christianity. 
And so can we put our hands together for a model, literally models. Can I tell you something? They wouldn't call themselves perfect. They wouldn't say they have theological degrees. They're just available. God isn't looking for exceptional. He's exceptional. He's looking for available. And you were made to make a difference. Can I tell you this? I think you already know that. You already know that. You already know deep down that when I do this hard thing that I don't want to do, but I do it and it benefits others, it feels good. I mean, it's like Christmas. My non-smart behind decided to have two children who have birthdays in December. That's what I did. So I have two birthdays in Christmas. How many of you guys understand buying gifts is hard? There's some suffering right there. Hello? It's expensive and it's interruptive and it takes a lot of time to go find the gifts. But how many of you guys know if you've ever went through the struggle of doing something at the expense of yourself for the benefit of others, there is nothing like watching children open birthday gifts or Christmas gifts. You know why you enjoy that? You ever done it? You know why you enjoy it? You were born to do that. That's a microcosm of the fulfillment you find when you're a minister that I don't live my life at the expense of others, but I leverage whatever God has given me to make a difference. And that's all they're doing. Not rocket science, faithful servants. In fact, even when they have stuff with their business out of state, they fly in early to serve your kids because they're not consumers. They're contributors. They're not here to get, they're here to give. And I'm just, I want that for you. You say, JD, how in the world do I get that? Because they're busy. They're going through a lot, but boy, you couldn't wipe the smile off their face. Zill Connect's how you do that. Did you know we have a course, a quick course, a class every Sunday at 11 o'clock? You know what it does? It just helps you identify. You're like, I don't know what my spiritual gifts are. Nobody ever told me. Every single Sunday at 11 o'clock, you can go to another service at 11 o'clock. You can get on a team based on your gifts. And your story can be, you know, I may be walking through something, but I'm making a difference. And listen, your favorite Sunday won't be the Sunday where you get the good word you came for. It'll be when you realize you were a part of plundering hell and populating heaven. Number three, and I'm done, write this down. Serving brings a smile. You're becoming a minister. That's what God wants for you. I pray that you have an elevated view today of what life could be. If Jesus has rule, Jesus has reign, and you wanna get there, Become a minister. Why? I want you to see Paul's language because for most of us, this would be awkward. He says, now I rejoice in my sufferings. For most people, even most people that would call themselves Christian, they could never do that. They just couldn't. If life was bad, they would be bad. If bank account was bad, they would be bad. If people were talking about them bad, they would feel bad. Circumstances define most people's countenance. Not ministers. Because they've learned to live life at the benefit of others. Let me tell you where it makes sense. The last part of it. Now I rejoice in my sufferings. Why? Because I'm not living for myself. It's for your sake. How many people have ever walked through something? Are oh, you going to lie? How many people have ever walked through something? Okay, watch this. Do you know what's gonna make more sense of the sucky times, the suffering times? When you don't live life for you. One of my mentors, John Maxwell, says this. If you wanna become great, the first thing that you need to do is get over you. Jesus said this. He said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. And I wanna show you the picture of Jeremiah and Sydney one more time. Because I know their story, I know the last several months with their extended family, it hasn't always been easy. Most people would sulk and run home. Most people would say, I'm too busy, I got too much going on. But if you talk to them right now, you would sense so much joy. Why? They are ministers. Yeah, he may be a business guy. Yes, you may be a business guy. And yeah, you may be a business guy. And yeah, you may be a single mom. And yeah, you may be a teacher. And yeah, you may be a doctor. Yeah, you may be an influence. Yeah, you may be running for Congress. But you have something more important in you. You are a minister.
minister. And if you ever reorganize your life to be a benefit to others, Satan cannot wipe the smile off of a servant because you were made to make a difference.